Well, I want to introduce um, our three panelists, and I'm, I'm going to introduce them one at a time as they come up to speak rather than uh, all at once, but I, I do want to mention their names. Uh, Mary Jane Deeb, uh, Michelle Dunn, and Matthew Duss. And I'll tell you a little more about each of them uh, before they speak. Uh, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb uh, is the Chief of the African and Middle East Division of the Library of Congress. Uh, and she began uh, on the staff of the Library of Congress in 1998 as a specialist in the African and Middle Eastern Division. And she became the chief of that division in 2006. Uh, she has uh, a distinguished uh, career uh, serving uh, prior to joining the library as editor of the Middle East Journal, director of the Omani Pro, uh, program at American University, director of the Algeria Working Group at the Corporate Council of Africa. She's written over 100 articles, written or co-written uh, some books on uh, particularly focusing on Libya. Uh, she's going to talk to us about a general overview of what's happening and why and what we might expect. So please welcome uh, Dr. Dee this morning. Thank you, thank you, Martin, and thank you all for being here tonight, today. Um, first, uh, a disclaimer. Uh, the views expressed here are my own and not those of the Library of Congress. Uh, I want to thank the Churches for Middle East Peace and its Executive Director, Warren Clark, for inviting me to speak today. It was a couple of months ago as we were discussing the events unfolding in the region over lunch that he asked me to come and talk about them at this conference, and then suggested that I link them to the prospects for peace in the region. So this presentation will focus on the Arab Spring. I will discuss three issues, namely, how the revolutions in the Arab world have come about, who the rebels are, and what they're demanding in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and Syria. I will conclude with some thoughts regarding the implications of the Arab Spring for the peace process uh, in the Middle East. During the 1960s and 70s, the dominant ideological paradigm in the region, first propounded by Nasser of Egypt, then adopted by Syria, uh, Iraq, Sudan, Libya, Algeria, southern Yemen, and briefly by Tunisia as well, was socialist and Arab nationalist. The socialist paradigm reflected not so much the Soviet Union's communist worldview, but rather that of the non-aligned nations, countries like Yugoslavia, India, and Indonesia. It called for major economic reforms, social and political reforms, it was secular, anti-imperialist, and in the Arab world, anti-Israeli as well. It called for Arabs to liberate Palestine from the Israeli occupation. As the socialist paradigm failed to keep its promises, and when I say paradigm, I mean a worldview, expectations. What is it that is going to solve the problems in the region? So the, the 60s and 70s was that you, know, you needed a socialist revolution to transform society. And those were the expectations. But that failed. And uh, it began to crumble in the Arab world in the 70s and, uh, and early 80s, finally collapsing completely with the fall of communism a few years later in Europe. The voices of those who had questioned that paradigm and fought against it became louder. Throughout the region, Islamists became more vociferous and more active, calling for Sharia law and a greater role for religion in the social and political spheres. But it was in Iran, and not in the Arab world, that the paradigm finally shifted. In February 1979, after months of demonstrations and strikes, the Shah of Iran left his country, and on April 1, 1979, Iranians voted in a referendum to become the first ever Islamic Republic, and eventually approved the constitution in which Sharia law, Islamic law, became the law of the land. The Ayatollah Khomeini became the supreme leader, and the governing body was constituted by the most honorable of men, the Ayatollahs. The Islamist paradigm had come into being. 
The Arabs witnessed the overthrow of the Iranian Shah and the creation of an Islamic Republic and wondered why that should not happen in other parts of the Muslim world as well. The Islamic paradigm spread as did its various conceptual manifestations. It was messianic in nature, it was not enough for one country to be ruled by Islamic law, but the entire Muslim world had to follow suit. From the most moderate of Islamists to the most radical, all advocated their version of the Islamic paradigm that would eventually lead to the good society. The motto was, <coughs> Islam ho al hal. Islam is the solution. In other words, all societal problems could be solved through Islam. The paradigm, too, was anti-Israeli and called for all Muslims to reclaim Palestine. Remember, the other one was all Arabs had to liberate Palestine, and the, the second one is all Muslims. So this is where you hear the, the, the Iranians and the, and the Pakistanis and others calling for that. The Islamist paradigm finally imploded this year with the Arab Spring. In fact, it had been disintegrating for quite a while already. The demise of that paradigm is best illustrated by the reaction to the news of the shooting of Osama bin Laden in Pakistan a couple of weeks ago. Basically, there was no public reaction. There was just silence in the Arab world. A few lonely voices mourned his death, such as that of Hamas in Gaza, some Salafists in Egypt and other uh, uh, elsewhere in the region. Only in Pakistan and Afghanistan was there some outpour of grief and anger. But even there, the reaction was rather muted. Brian Murphy, a foreign correspondent for the Associated Press, wrote a piece after the killing of Bin Laden entitled Islamic World Quiet as Bin Laden Age Closes. He interviewed a number of people in the region and asked them why there had been no reaction. A professor of political science in the region answered him, Bin Laden died in Egypt before he was killed in Pakistan meaning that paradigm of radical and violent Islamism no longer had any appeal. Amr Shubaki, the head of the Arab European Unit in the Cairo Al Ahram Center for Political and Strategic Studies, the premier think tank in Egypt, was quoted in the Washington Post as saying, Al Qaeda, through its violent operations in the Arab states and all over the world, has lost all sympathy in the region. The point they were making here is that the violence associated with the Islamic paradigm was detrimental to Arabs and Muslims themselves. Arabs realized that the revolution could take place without violence, as long as they could bring together enough people to voice their demands. With the demise of the Islamist paradigm, a new paradigm, a new worldview, has emerged, which is being adopted by a whole new generation of Arabs and uh, and others throughout the Muslim world. This paradigm is that of a secular, democratic, non-violent, non-ideological society whose citizens are nationalists while maintaining their Arab and Muslim identities. That paradigm, in contrast to the two others, is not anti-Israeli. But first, how did those revolutions come about? I contend that the popular outburst of anger that followed the young Tunisian self-immolation in December 2010 and brought down the Tunisian regime was not a discrete event, but rather a continuation of such demonstrations and strikes, not only in Tunisia, but also in other parts of the Arab world, including in Egypt, Libya, Syria, and Yemen, where the revolutions are taking place, as well as in Lebanon, Algeria, Morocco, Jordan, and elsewhere in the region where they're not. Rather, not yet. Let me give you some examples. Starting in 2004 in Egypt, there was a wave of unprecedented strikes of workers in both the public and private sectors. According to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and we have Michel Dan here, we'll talk about those, those issues, there were over 3,000 strikes leading up to the revolution since 2004, in which an estimated 2 million uh, workers participated. Pro-democracy protests took place in Egypt in 2005. 
and brought to the fore a young leader and a new party called El Ghal tomorrow, who contested the presidential elections that had taken place that year. The leader, Ayman Noor, was arrested and tortured, and the movement was quelled. In 2005, another pro-democracy movement, Kefaya, enough, demonstrated outside Cairo University. The demonstrators were young, educated, secular people who demanded democratic changes and chanted anti-Mubarak slogans calling for the president's ouster. Once again, the government cracked down on the demonstrators. In Syria, there were also strikes in 2005 when hundreds of intellectuals, human rights activists, and other opposition leaders called for freedom and democracy in their country. They too were detained or arrested by the Syrian security forces. But most important was the 2005 Cedar Revolution in Lebanon. In March 2005, Lebanon witnessed an unprecedented movement calling itself the Cedar Revolution. It was made up of young men and young women from all confessional groups who for an entire month after the assassination of the Lebanese Prime Minister Hariri demonstrated peacefully, demanding the ouster of the Syrian forces that had occupied Lebanon for 30 years. The outpouring was such that Syrian forces were recalled back to their barracks in Syria. Young people across the Arab world watched and cheered as they witnessed military forces retreating before the peaceful, unarmed demonstrators. Robert Fisk wrote an article in The Independent recently entitled, The Arab Awakening began not in Tunisia this year, but in Lebanon in 2005. In November 2005, a United Nations inquiry team was set up to question members of the family of Syria's head of state, Bashar al-Assad, in connection with the, the assassination of the Lebanese Prime Minister. Eventually, a UN special commission would be set up to investigate this murder and bring to justice the culprits. After 30 years of political assassinations in Lebanon, whose perpetrators were never prosecuted, it appeared that at last the world was taking notice and calling for justice and accountability, even if that meant investigating the conduct of those closest to an Arab ruler. Then there was the trial of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Although Arabs had almost unanimously condemned the war on Iraq, the arrest and trial of Saddam Hussein, one of the most oppressive dictators in the Middle East, was another matter. Arabs watched the 2005-2006 trial on television, heard the witnesses testify against Saddam, heard him defend himself, and witnessed the team of lawyers that had been made available to him for his defense, including the the daughter of Gaddafi, Aisha. In contrast to the vociferous condemnation of the war, the reaction to the trial in the Arab world was subdued. <coughs> Although Saddam had been caught by American forces, he was tried in an Arab court by a panel of Iraqi judges. It was the first time that an Arab ruler had been asked to account for his misdeeds before his own people, and that some of those people were able to testify against him freely before a court of law and without fear of retaliation. To the rest of the Arab world, this meant that it was now possible to hold leaders accountable for their actions and that the leaders, their relatives and supporters were no longer above the law. Who then is behind the Arab Spring? The answer is, superficially at least, quite simple. The Arab youth, young people in their 20s and 30s, but if we ask why them, why not those of the previous generation? After all, this generation is much better off than its elders, economically, socially, and even politically. The answer becomes more complex. This is the generation that, despite some dismal statistics, is more educated in absolute terms than all previous generations in the region. 
Most students attend the venerable national institutions of higher learning in the region, such as Cairo University, University of Damascus in Syria, Aden and Sana'a University in Yemen, Tunis University in Tunisia, Yunus University in Benghazi, and so on. Each country has also a large number of institutes of technology, where young people are trained, among other things, in computer science and information <coughs> technology. In addition, almost every country, Arab country today has or is in the process of opening American or American-style universities for its students. Traditionally, there are only two such universities, the American University in Beirut and the American University in Cairo. There was one, of course, in Turkey. Both built in the second part of the 19th century. Today, Lebanon has three more American style institutions for high, of higher learning. In Jordan, there is the Philadelphia University. The United Arab, uh, Arab Emirates, there is the American University in Dubai, and the American University in Sharjah. In Kuwait, there is the American University of Kuwait. And in Morocco, there is the Akhawain University, an American style university, developed primarily by the Texas A&M uh, University. There's also an American university in Jenin, in, uh, in the West Bank, and many more. And there are some of the most ambitious projects uh, have taken place in the Gulf country, Persian Gulf countries. So you have uh, in Qatar, for example, you have Cornell University, the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Arts in uh, Qatar, the Texas A&M University, Mellon University, Georgetown University, have all open campuses and are training people there. The important thing here is that these institutions are open to everyone, regardless of citizenship. And Arabs from the region who are not sent to Europe or the United States to complete their studies attend these schools. The majority of the faculty is also American or European. The result is that educated young people today are more likely to have been exposed to more liberal education than their elders and be aware of the basic democratic values of free speech, freedom of association, freedom of the press, the right to choose their form of government, individual rights before the law, etc., and to be conscious that those rights were either curtailed or denied in their own countries. Educated young people are also more likely to have the skills to use the internet and all the other communication tools, and the social networks and websites where people interact, share photos, opinions, videos, such as Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Consequently, education has been more critical in this revolutionary movement than it has in any other social uprising in the region. Thanks to those skills and to the level of education of the rebels, information about what is happening in their own country, region, and the rest of the world has been easily accessible. Unlike the previous generation, the youth today know immediately what is taking place and it has become more difficult to hide security crackdowns on dissidents, to pretend that elections are anything but charades, to block criticism by other countries of government policies, to conceal scams and rampant corruption. Thus, the new information technology has both informed Arab youths of the ills of society and given them the tools with which to address them. But they were not the only ones who participated in the demonstrations and protests in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Syria, and Yemen. Young military conscript, conscripts joined the, uh, the fray. In fact, thanks to conscription, in most countries of the Arab world, at least 60% of the armies are made up of conscripts who have no particular allegiance to the military I want to get out of it to pursue other careers. It is those young soldiers that we saw supporting the protesters in Tahrir Square. In Tunisia, we had the head of the Tunisian army, General Rashid Ammar, who refused to follow orders of, by the president to shoot protesters. He took the side of the people and forced President Ben Ali to resign. And no violence ensued. In Yemen, General Ali Mohsen Ahmar, who heads the Yemeni army in the northwest part of the country, announced in March that the military forces under his command would support the revolution, leading to massive defections from the army, including that of 11 military commanders and their units. In Libya, the army was weak, but when the uprising took place in Cyrenaica, 
the army split and the military in the eastern part joined the revolution days. In Syria, apparently, when some young conscripts refused to shoot people, they were shot instead. It appears that in Dera, when the protests began, the conscripts joined the revolutionaries as well. A third group that joined the rebels was the workers. Labor strikes, in conjunction with the demonstrations in Egypt and Tunisia, took place all over the country in support of the rebels. For example, the textile workers of Mahal al Kubra, the heart of the textile industry in Egypt, went on strike when the rebels were demonstrating in Tahrir Square. There were the Suez Canal workers joined the strikes in three major cities uh, in uh, Suez, Port Said, and Ismaili as well. Uh, in the case of Tunisia, the Union Générale Tunisienne du Travail, one of the oldest and most powerful trade unions in the Arab world, was a leading force in the revolution that overthrew President Ben Ali. The fourth group that joined the rebels has been the civil servants and high-level professionals in all fields. Um, after General Ali Mohsen al-Ahmar of Yemen decided to join the revolutionaries, regional governors, editors of government newspapers, prominent uh, businessmen, senior members of the ruling party, and numerous ambassadors quit their jobs and took, took the side of the revolutionaries. In Egypt, civil servants, professionals took the streets as well. Those included university professors, school teachers, lawyer syndicates, journalists, members of human rights organizations, women associations, and others. We saw the same phenomenon occurring in Libya with uh, numerous um, uh, members of the government actually uh, taking the side of the revolutionaries, resigning from their job. And the Libyans are interesting because they are the first to establish an interim government and administrative bodies that sought and received international recognition. Uh, the National Transition Authority uh, has 31 members, uh, but they represent undoubtedly not so much the young people who are fighting, but the professionals who are supporting them and working to get international military, political, and humanitarian assistance for the revolution. In Tunisia, it was the lawyers who began to protest in December 2011. And later in January, thousands of Tunisian law law lawyers went on strike. I should also mention briefly that in the case of Libya, and to some extent Syria too, there is still another group that is supporting the uprising, namely the tribes of eastern Libya. These have traditionally resented Gaddafi's rule, and he in turn has been quite severe in cracking down on them. Thus, as we can see, there is a wide cross-section of society that has participated in the protests, although those protests were led by the young. So what do the protesters want? Uh, it is clear that after rejecting what Islamists were offering, namely happiness in the afterlife, they are looking for happiness in the here and now. <laughs> The rallying cry of all this revolution has been the overthrow of the regime in power and the setting up of free and fair elections and democratic institutions. Some of the protesters, such as those in Syria, started by asking for reforms, but when security forces began shooting at unarmed civilians, then they called for the end of the regime. The economic demands, especially from the striking workers, are for higher salaries and better economic working conditions, and the unemployed graduates' demands focus on the creation of jobs. The global economic downturn since 2008 has affected the Arab world. They have been growing at a vigorous 5 to 6 percent annually for, the, for at least five years. Existing jobs disappeared, incomes fell, while concomitantly the cost of food and energy rose significantly. Rampant corruption has been another major source of grief in every case with Tunisians blaming the family of the president's wife, the Tarabulsis, the Egyptians attacking the steel magnet who's now behind bars, where Syria, yes, just two minutes, who controls the country's largest mobile phone, their offices were, were burned, and the other demand were uh, judges and lawyers uh, 
ask for independent judiciary and the constitution in Libya, neither of which exists in their country, and the issue of an independent judiciary has been a major, uh, a major demand in all those revolutions. So, in conclusion, what does all that mean for Israel? First, none of the demands of the protesters have anything to do with Israel. No one is calling for revoking the peace treaties between Israel and Egypt, and I'm talking about the protesters now, okay? uh, between uh, Israel and Egypt and Jordan. No one is calling for the liberation of Palestine. None of the young people involved in the Arab Spring is particularly concerned with Israel. Second, those revolutions are strongly nationalist, emphasizing domestic concerns not international ones. While they support young people in other Arab countries, they're not volunteering to go and fight with them. That applies to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. The revolutionaries appear to believe that it needs to be resolved by the people directly concerned, not by others, be they Arab or Muslim. Third, the revolutionaries have rejected violence as a means of achieving their goals and condemned the violence used against them by the state. They have made this, this their mantra. Therefore, it is very unlikely that those young people who want to take arms against it is very unlikely that those young people will want to take arms against Israel or join forces with those who want to fight against Israel. Fourth, they are not Islamists but secular. They have made a point of rejecting Islamists and of including religious minorities such as Christians in their movement. This is particularly true of Egypt, where the Copts were part of the revolutionary movement, and where the cross and the Quran were par paraded together during the protests. Like Christians, Jews are people of the book for Muslims, and secular young people feel no particular animosity against Jews on a religious basis. While all of the above does not hold true for Islamists, including Muslim brothers, it does hold true for the young revolutionaries who will be leading the region in a few years. Consequently, in my considered opinion, this may be a good time to take a fresh look at all the peace initiatives on the table and feel more confident that the new generation in the Arab world is less interested in going to war against Israel than it is in building, building peaceful and successful relations with Israel and successful lives in their own countries. Thank you. with us, especially because this is an extremely important day for her, and I know she has to leave right after her presentation. Um, so we're very pleased that we're able to take time and be with us. Welcome. Let's welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be with you. I've been meeting with groups from churches for Middle East Peace for a very long time, I think like over 20 years, and so uh, I'm, I'm happy to be with you, um, uh, but I, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to have to do what one of my professors used to say, I, I'm sorry, but I shall have to love you and leave you, because I, um, it's, it's Carnegie, the Carnegie Endowment Centennial celebration today and tomorrow, and I have something at 10 o'clock, which means that we've got about 12 minutes here. So uh, here's, uh, I want to say a few things to you uh, about Egypt, uh, because Egypt, as you know, is, uh, it is one quarter of the Arab world, and honestly, it's where the Arab Spring is going to live or die. Uh, if, if, if democracy is going to have a real chance uh, in the Arab world, if it's really going to spread, it's going to be from Egypt, uh, and I don't expect it to be a, some. I don't expect it to be quick. I don't expect Egypt to be a functioning democracy in a year or two. I think this is a, a project of 10, 15 years, and it's going to be a rough road between here and there. But still, I do think it is it is possible for this to be a success, and I think the impact, uh, certainly in the Arab region and far beyond, will be enormous. And it will also be enormous if Egypt fails. So please, uh, please keep that in mind. Um, look, it, Egypt, I think right now is at a place where it is. There is still a revolution going on. The Egyptian revolution that began on January 25th isn't over. 
the, the process of kind of tearing down of the Mubarak regime, of the decades of authoritarian rule, half a century, more than half a century of authoritarian rule, is still underway. And at the same time, um, there are efforts to move the country out of revolution and into a political transition, into elections and a political process. And there's a tension between these two things. And that's why we still regularly see thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of people showing up in Tahrir Square and other places in Egypt demanding, for example, the prosecution of President Mubarak, his family, and other senior members of the old regime. Because these same forces that started the protests, uh, and I think that Mira Jane really eloquently described what's behind all of this and how these forces came to be, those, those people are very determined not to see the reemergence of the old regime, which can easily happen in a transition like this. So um, that process is going on. Now there are things in Egypt that have changed since the revolution. Since the revolution began, as I said, I don't think it's over. And there are things that haven't changed. What has changed is, I think, this whole model of the monarchical presidency, of the president for life, not freely selected by the people, not accountable to the people, uh, bringing in the son after the president. I think this model of leadership in Egypt is dead. And that's actually saying a big thing, <laughs> how far the pharaonic model goes back in Egypt. But I, 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 think this is, <laughs> I, I think this is over now in Egypt, okay? And, um, uh, and then the other thing that, that has changed is there's a real determination to, um, to move toward, toward free elections and free contestation. Political parties are now being formed uh, and people are very determined that elections will be run cleanly and so forth. They really want to end also the corruption, the economic corruption and cronyism that characterized the Mubarak regime. But there are a lot of things in Egypt that haven't changed yet. As you know, Egypt is now run by the armed forces, by something called the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. What the protesters in Egypt did, in effect, was to force a military coup, to force the military to carry out a coup. And once, uh, and they showed all this support for the military, we are one, the people in the military, bring down Mubarak. And as soon as the military brought down Mubarak, we were into chapter two, which is now how do we get rid of the military? Okay, so that's, that's where we are now. Now the military in Egypt has sort of played the game in a relatively above board way and said we don't want to hold on to political power, we want to hold elections, we want to turn things over. To, uh, to a civilian authority. We want to go back to uh, back to being the power behind the throne rather than on the throne. And I, I take them at their word. I do think that's true. But these things can change, too. And it's something to look out for. And it's something that the protesters are keenly aware of, the fear that the military will somehow, there, there will be, uh, you know, a desire to hang on to power, a desire to have more power behind the scenes than they should have, and so forth. And the military has tremendous economic interests in Egypt, and, and there will be a, uh, a high motivation on the part of the military to hold on to some amount of political power in order to protect their economic interests. Um, the other thing is that, um, so everything hasn't changed in Egypt. Another thing that hasn't changed is the, the internal security services, which were tremendously repressive under Mubarak and huge, three times the size of the armed forces in terms of manpower. They are still there. And although there have been some efforts, I think so far mostly lip service at, at reform and they're going to operate differently, they're not going to get involved in politics, get involved in people's personal lives. This we have yet to see. And this truly this is something that can't hope happen overnight. It's a long, difficult process, but I think that's very much a question mark as to now. And in my opinion, if that doesn't change, if Egypt doesn't stop being a police state where everybody informs on everybody and where internal security services are getting in and manipulating politics, intimidating people, then, then Egypt is not becoming a democracy. That is something that is absolutely essential. So internal security reform is essential. And eventually, 
I don't think this is going to happen overnight, but eventually civilian oversight of military is, is necessary. This is a whole new idea in a place like Egypt. The idea that in the future, perhaps the parliament could actually, um, you know, there could be full transparency in the military budget and, and the parliament, you know, civilian leaders have oversight of that. Uh, there, I mean, there are calls for that in Egypt, but it's very new and it's certainly a very new idea to the military. So these are all things that are out there. I, I think that um, in Egypt, after the uh, uh, protests and so forth, Egyptians have a clearer idea of what they don't want than they do of what they do want for their future, right? I already talked about some of the things that people have agreed they don't want. They don't want a monarchical president. Uh, they don't want human rights abuses, uh, torture, police brutality. These were widespread in Egypt. They don't want corruption and cronyism uh, controlling the economy. They don't want rigged elections. In terms of what they do want for a political and economic system, that's a little bit less formed at this point. For example, one of the things that Egypt is going to undergo a rewriting of its constitution, and it's possible that they will have a whole new political system. Right now, they have a presidential system uh, in which they've got a president who appoints the cabinet, and then there's an elected parliament. Now, everyone agrees that um, in, the, in the future, the president needs to have less power and the elected parliament needs to have more power. But some people want to change this to a parliamentary system. Uh, in which the president would have virtually no power, and in which the government, a prime minister and cabinet, would arise out of the elected parliament. That's unclear at this point. That's a possibility, but there's no, I think there's no consensus at this point on, on that. There's also a little, uh, I think, only a, a vague sense of what they want for the economic system. Uh, president Mubarak's government had carried out a uh, Incomplete but, but significant free market economic reforms, creating a business friendly climate, etc. Unfortunately, the, the, there was extensive corruption and cronyism, and the benefits of those reforms were shared very unequally, and there's deep resentment of that in Egypt. So now there's a strong social justice imperative and a bit of a, an imperative toward more state control of the economy. However, there are a lot of Egyptians who realize that that's probably not a, that's not a recipe for economic growth and for generating the 700,000 new jobs a year that Egypt needs to generate, that they need to create an, uh, uh, that those are going to come from the private sector, not the government, and that they're going to have to have a, an atmosphere that is conducive to both domestic and foreign investment. But right now, uh, I think people are very confused, and there's definitely a populist impulse when it comes to the economy. Um, the, the other, uh, another concern, um, a, a, an old problem that is resurfacing in a very ugly way right now is sectarianism in Egypt. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, Egypt, uh, of Egypt's 83 million people, about 10% are Christians. And uh, there has been very ugly tension between Muslims and Christians, and especially between Salafi Muslims, these more um, extreme fundamentalist Muslims uh, who have been seen, you know, increasingly a phenomenon in Egypt, not just since the revolution. I've been watching this for a couple of years now. This is, they, they have been increasingly vocal. They're not necessarily the most numerous uh, and certainly, I think the Muslim Brotherhood, which represents a somewhat more uh, moderate form of political Islam, is probably has much more support. But the Salafis have been creating a lot of trouble, and it's specifically around the issues of religious freedom, um, conversion from one religion to another, uh, unfortunately, is deeply unacceptable in Egyptian society. And it's unacceptable to both communities. It's unacceptable to Christians as it is to Muslims. And when, when people try to leave one community for the other, um, it causes tremendous problems and tremendous tensions and often violence. The other thing is the building of churches, uh, which has been a long-term problem in Egypt for a long time. The, the laws have been very unequal. And um, 
that that is a, a, a causes tremendous tension and economic jealousy between Muslims and Christians often in a community when when one is building a new house of worship. So these are unresolved problems in Egypt. Um, they are maybe exacerbated by the, the, the situation now. It's a bit of a Pandora's box, right, where the lid is off and everything is coming out. But I do think these problems have deep roots in Egyptian society, and they need to be dealt with in a much more effective way than either the previous Egyptian government or the current transitional government has dealt with them. I unfortunately don't have time to say more about that. Let me just leave you with this. I know you're going to be out and about on the hill, and I want to make a plea to you to have Egypt in mind and to be supporting economic assistance for Egypt. As you know, President Obama last week laid out a package of economic assistance. It would include debt relief, uh, it would include uh, loans, and so forth. And I and it has a little bit of a trade element. I think it should have much more of a free trade element. I think the United States should be moving toward opening free trade negotiations with Egypt. I see this as the way to incentivize in Egypt sound economic growth policies. Both the United States and Europe need to offer Egypt uh, trade incentives, that's the best way to persuade them to undertake sound economic growth policies. And those sound economic growth policies are going to be the way to avoid a disastrous, uh, whoops, excuse me, along with short-term help, that short-term stabilization help. The debt relief can do that, and the IMF and World Bank can offer that kind of help so that Egypt doesn't have a budget crisis. What we don't want to see is a disastrous economic situation in Egypt a couple of years from now that then leads to political extremism and, um, and, and brings this whole democratic experiment down. That's what we don't want to see. I do believe that U.S. assistance should be carefully constructed, should be conditioned, it should be built upon and staged to support a democratic uh, transition. I don't think we should be just you know, giving them, giving them carte blanche right now when we're not sure what's going to happen. But it's important to send the signals now that we are ready uh, with, with, with debt relief and also with, with trade to support a real transition in Egypt to democracy and to prosperity. And with that, I thank you very much for your time, and I'm sorry, but I must run it. I've been asked for 60 seconds on the border of Gaza. I'll give you 30. Um, uh, look, e Egyptian foreign policy going forward, is going, I don't think it's going to be radically different from Mubarak's foreign policy, but it's going to have a different style. They're going to be more, uh, they're going to be more responsive to public opinion in Egypt, and as you know, public opinion in Egypt has been very against uh, what Mubarak did with keeping a pretty hard border with Gaza. So what I think we're going to see is Egypt acting a bit more independently than it has in the past, a bit, bit more nationalistically. And I don't think, uh, but I, I don't think Egypt has any interest, for example, in helping Hamas arm itself in Gaza uh, and, and so forth. And they certainly don't have an interest in having a wide open border with Gaza that could, in the case of another emergency, uh, end up sending, you know, allowing tens or even hundreds of thousands of Palestinians into the Sinai. That's that's a, that's a national security disaster for Egypt. They have very serious terrorism problems in the Sinai as it is. So I, I think, as I said, the style of Egyptian policy is going to be different. Uh, watch the details carefully, and I think you'll see it's not going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be a 180 degree turn from what Mubarak did. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Our next speaker is uh, Matthew Duss. Mr. Duss is a policy analyst and director of Middle East Progress at this program, right? Middle East Program at the Center for American Progress. Uh, he has, uh, his analysis has appeared in a number of major papers across the country, Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, the Baltimore Sun, a number of others. 
and he has appeared as a commentator on a number of uh, TV and radio news programs. So, uh, welcome, please, uh, Mr. Matthew Duff. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm just going to talk for a bit about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, what President Obama said the other day in his speech about his approach to that conflict, his analysis of the role that it plays in U.S. policy, and put it in some historical context of U.S. policy in the region over the past decades, um, and then talk about what that means for our policy, hopefully, um, uh, in the future. I would say the most important part of President Obama's remarks on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on Thursday uh, was not what he said, but just how much he said, where he said it, and what that says about his view of the continuing significance of this conflict for U.S. policy and interest in the region. In the speech of some 5,600 words, almost 1,200 of them, 20%, were devoted to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This indicates that while the President's approach to resolving the conflict may have changed his recognition of the importance of resolving it, it has not. In a speech that spanned a region in turmoil and transition, he came to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict last. This indicated to me an understanding that while the conflict is certainly not the only problem in the region, its continuing irresolution handicaps the United States' ability to address those other problems. This shouldn't be surprising. Barack Obama has been clear about this view since he was a candidate for president when he referred in an interview to the conflict as, quote, a constant sore that infects all of our foreign policy. In the two years since he took office, appointing a special envoy, George Mitchell, to handle the, the issue on the second day of his presidency, this analysis has been backed up repeatedly by others in his, his administration, including Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, then CENTCOM Chief, now incoming CIA Director General David Petraeus. WikiLeaks cables, the WikiLeaks documents, the State Department cables also uh, revealed Arab rulers deeply concerned about the conflict's negative impact in the region. We should note that while most in the Middle East, as elsewhere in the world, are concerned primarily with increasing their own security and economic opportunity, there's simply no question that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict continues to dramatically impact the region's domestic politics. It will continue to be a major determinant of attitudes toward the United States. According to a recent Time article on expectations of, for President Obama's speech, Quote, for many Arabs, including every person interviewed in Cairo for this story, the litmus test of whether the U.S. is serious about revising its relations with the Arab world is its attitude toward the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This analysis is sometimes referred to as linkage, but I don't think we even need to refer to it as linkage anymore. We can just refer to it as reality. But while recognizing, or in President Obama's case, reaffirming reality is important, more important is what he's going to do about it, and here the speech said little. The speech, I understand, wasn't the place for President Obama to offer specifics on strategy, but that time has to come soon in time to avert a looming disaster in September, with the Palestinians uh, achieving, attempting to achieve recognition for their state um, by the UN, which has a host of problems for the United States and its influence and credibility. Having recognized the importance to U.S. interests of resolving this conflict, Obama should also recognize how devastating it would be for the U.S. to spend the time between now and September simply working to block the Palestinians' unilateral statement effort. Instead, he should commit to crafting a fair and credible process that could entice the Palestinians away from it and bring them back to the negotiating table under clear terms of record. I hope Thursday's speech marked the beginning of an effort to do that. I must admit, however, that after the soaring rhetoric and complete lack of policy follow-through of the Packer speech, I'm not entirely optimistic, but I am ready to be surprised. The President has repeatedly said that the status quo is not sustainable, and I think that's quite right, but the question is what then? Will he put the energy and political capital behind creating a more progressive order? I think he must. I think America has a key role here in assuring Israel and Israelis um, that we will be there and help them kind of navigate some of these currents, which are going to be difficult, there's no question. Um, this transition, transition is going to be uh, occasionally chaotic, and that's, that's scary for anyone. But um, it's, it clearly has to be done. Uh, just to, to draw back uh, and look at U.S. policy, especially after the, the passing of Osama bin Laden, I'll just say passing, and we can use whatever else, whatever word they want. But I, I would hope that it would provide us with an opportunity to think more rigorously about what Osama bin Laden represented 
and what that means for the United States' future relationship with Arab republics, to, to whom President Obama has repeatedly appealed, and appealed, I think, on Thursday. The New York Times' Anthony Shadid and David Kirkpatrick recently uh, reported about bin Laden's complex legacy in the Arab world. I think we just heard correctly that his ideology, his, his theory of violence and the appropriateness of violence against civilians is, is, is widely rejected in the region. But I think there was and still remains some measure of admiration for a man who's, who defiantly declared war on the regimes that have oppressed Arabs for decades, or are perceived as having oppressed rightly or wrongly, and on the great power patron of the United States who is seen as having facilitated that oppression. One of the great ironies of U.S. policy after the September 11 attacks was that, was that President George Bush seemed to grasp bin Laden's appeal, though it was cynical, was rooted in real grievances against longstanding U.S. support for undemocratic regimes, and that this regional status quo was sustainable. But having diagnosed this problem, his administration's prescription, which involved invading and occupying Iraq as a way to kickstart regional change, directly resulted in its having to abandon some of its democracy promotion policies and double down on support for those same dictators, pleading with them to help stem the extremist tide that the Iraq debacle unleashed. Fortunately, Al-Qaeda's own strategic stupidity prevented the organization from profiting too much from this. Its staggering brutality in Iraq and other countries, such as Jordan, managed to alienate rather than embolden and inspire new recruits, though of course many of those who did join up to fight in Iraq have returned to their respective countries, such as Yemen, uh, where they are part of a continuing problem. But it would be, it would be a mistake to interpret Al-Qaeda's failure in this respect as a U.S. policy success. We've seen spectacularly over the past few months that the grievances to which bin Laden appealed are still present in the Middle East. The difference is that they have been expressed in a far more admirable and inspiring way by those who've demonstrated in Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, Syria, and elsewhere. But the truth is, the U.S. foreign policy hasn't been able to squarely consider what made bin Laden's propaganda resonate as much as it did, and what a radical shift this might require for U.S. policy in the region. My, my friend Brian Katulis often refers to our addiction to dictators. We know it's wrong, we want to stop, but we just can't stop. <laughs> the Arab Spring of Revolutions, or what I desperately hope will be an Arab Spring, makes it more imperative than ever that we, that we do this. What bin Laden got right is the strong perception among Muslims in that the United States' relationship with the Muslim Middle East has not been very good for Muslims in the Middle East. To say that the relationship has built upon security imperatives is facile. All relationships between states are to some extent built, to a great extent, built upon security. More specifically, this relationship has built on a very short-sighted and long-outdated vision of security, in which the primary point of American engagement was its military, buttressing authoritarian leaders who promised to keep their people quiet and the oil flowing. The people of the Middle East have rejected this bargain. The United States must reject it as well. Now, just to get back to President Obama's speech and what I think was positive about it, first of all, where he held it at the State Department. Um, this, this recognized, I think, that it's appropriate for the United States to expand the point of contact beyond the military. Um, the State Department is an important tool. It needs to be used more. Um, it, we need to cultivate strong relations between peoples, not just between security services. It's something he and Secretary Clinton have both stressed, and again, I, I hope this was a signal that they're intending to, to move on this. The reference to the, the, the Tunisian fruit vendor, Mohammed Bazizi, who really kicked this off in Tunisia, was also very important. Why did he set himself on fire? He was humiliated. He had a life without dignity. Helping people live lives with dignity, I think, has to be at the root of U.S. policy. My, another friend, Spencer, journalist Spencer Ackerman, recognized this very early on during President Obama's campaign. Rather than democracy promotion, it is dignity promotion. De democracy is one aspect of helping people live dignified lives of opportunity and security. I think a great illustration of this sentiment is found in one of our great classic American movies, Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. The, uh, the great scene, one of my father's favorites, where, where Jimmy Stewart uh, makes the great speech to Mr. Potter, who's talking about the rabble. He says, this rabble, they do most of the work in paying, living and dying. Is it too much to ask for them to do that with a couple of decent rooms and a bath? Is it too much to ask for them to have dignity? It shouldn't be. And again, I go back even farther. The same sentiment was uh, it's part of the uh, Matthew 25, 31 through 46, the parables of the sheep and the goats. 
which I can summarize as follows. We are all in this together. <laughs> Your dignity and security and my dignity and security are intimately bound up together. So I think that's a good place for me to stop as an American of Christian background referencing a 2,000-year-old Jewish rabbi in support of new policies toward the Muslim world. Security of borders and the new uh, at the new uh, landscape. Um, I don't think it's going to change very much in the next coming, uh, 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 let's say, year or two. I don't think there's a change that's taking place. In other words, the Arab Spring is not going to create new realities as such. It's more. It's going to be more of the same. I mean, this this is by my perception. There hasn't been a call to change things on the ground. Uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, the Arab Spring is not going to create new realities. What, I'm, what, I, what I said was that there is no call for violence, there is no call for war against Israel, there is no, no call for changing, uh, withdrawing the, the, the treaties from the rebels. Uh, on the contrary, there is an openness among the young people uh, for better relations globally, regionally and globally. Uh, so I feel optimistic that things can improve. Uh, 
But as Michelle Dunn mentioned, and she's quite right, okay, it depends how these evolution, uh, revolutions work, uh, work their way through. Okay? But basically, the revolutions are not anti-Israel. Uh, anti and therefore, uh, the realities on the ground are not, are not going to change. Um, and on the issue of, of Hamas, I think the, the, um, the issue is that uh, the, the Palestinians were uh, interested in bringing forth a united view to the, to, the, to the National Assembly. In other words, they, they uh, closed ranks in order to go to the, to the United Nations as one people rather than two divided. Now what that, that would mean in the long run when Hamas does not recognize uh, Israel uh, is going to be uh, an issue. But the sheer fact that it wants to join up with, uh, with the Palestinian Authority and go to the United Nations and present a Palestinian state, ipso facto, that's a recognition of Israel. Because if you're saying, I'm going there to, to, to present a Palestinian state, you're saying two states, and therefore one has to be um, the, the state of Israel. That's what I have to say. <coughs> Uh, first on the question of Hamas, I think the, the president actually has been quite good on this question given the realities of American politics. I think he's gone about as far out on this issue as he really conceivably can, which is to say, let's wait and see. We have very serious questions about Hamas, as I, I think we all should, as, as I do, um, with the fact, what does this mean that they have they've come to this unity agreement now? I think it's been clear for some time that there is an ongoing debate within the mass between pragmatists and extremists. I don't know what that really means for the movement as a whole, but just I would say I think in 2006, when Hamas won the, the elections, there was a real <coughs> lost opportunity there. Uh, the Bush administration's decision not to kind of take yes for an answer. The fact was whether or not Hamas said they refused would never recognize Israel. The fact that Hamas participated in elections that were held under the auspices of the Oslo process and effectively affirm those principles by, uh, by participating in, in the election. So, um, yeah, I think as President Obama said on Thursday, let's wait and see. Hamas has to answer some questions about, there's the use of terrorism, I would know, however, that since the unity agreement, there has not been a single border fired from Gaza. Very important. Um, and uh, under the quartet, the quartet principles, uh, which are, and terrorism, you recognize uh, Israel and honor past agreements. I would say, you know, there is not a single party in the current Israeli government that meets all those three conditions themselves. Um, I think, in my view, the violence condition is is the main one. I understand the the, the, the I understand the, the theory behind using all those three conditions. But again, I think we should pre be prepared to hear some answers to these questions that are not exactly what we might want. On Israel's indefensible borders, uh, another friend of mine, I, this, this, this argument has always interested me because they talk about the 67 borders as being indefensible. Well, what happened in 67? <laughs> Seems like Israel defended those borders pretty effectively. Um, um, I mean, there, I think it's not so much a question of whether the surrounding Arab countries are going to invade. I don't think anybody seriously thinks that's going to happen. It's just Israel's security presence in the West Bank, its ability to obtain intelligence about possible terrorist activity. Um, I think that's what's really an issue here. And I think that's a real concern. I mean, but this gets down to a question of trust between Israel and a new Palestinian state. What is the relationship between the security services of those two states? Um, and if Israel's hope is to have, you know, to be certain, to admit, you know, to a metaphysical certainty that there's no danger of violence, well, that's obviously not going to happen. No country in the world enjoys that kind of that kind of certainty. So it really just, it's a question of establishing a level of trust between the two, the two states and, and, and their uh, security services. Um, as to the question about the UN, why would it be bad? I think first of all, just on a basic, you know, credibility is, it's a fuzzy concept in international relations, international politics, but I think 
I think there is an issue here. The United States has repeatedly stressed that this is a matter of core concern, resolving this. And the idea that it would have to, that the Palestinians would circumvent our brokerage and find success somewhere else, I think that would just be bad for the U.S. record and perception of our ability to get things done. Um, that in and of itself is not kind of a dispositive argument, but I think that's important, important here. And I would also just, you know, statehood recognized what then? I think if it were recognized in the General Assembly, there are potentially other kind of international mechanisms that would work in. There's questions about the ICC, what does that mean for Israelis traveling abroad. I think all of these are ways that the Palestinians are using this process quite intelligently, in my view, to create pressure and leverage on the Israelis, but more importantly, I think, on the Americans to, to kind of step to and, and come up with a better process. Um, but I think to, to kind of steal an idea that I heard from my friend Naomi Kazan, which is that there's a real danger here in decoupling statehood from deoccupation. So if they were to be recognized as a state, but were still occupied, I'm sorry, did I, did I, did I take that from your speech? What are you going to talk about? <laughs> She's going to talk about it in much more depth and in, in, in much more nuance, so I you know, look forward to hearing about that, but I think that's also a danger. So. We've got lots of time. The next three, uh, one, two, and three. Speak out. Uh, since we give Israel over three billion a year in times that are economically tough for us, how can we ensure that those three billion are spent in a way that forwards U.S. policy in the matter of two-party states, simply <coughs> giving the money that can be used to often be the building of the wall in the summer? So is there a way that our aid can result in more influence? Uh, who is next? Right there. Uh, this is for Dr. D. Uh, the characteristics in the Arab Spring, which you said the key ones were nonviolence, it's a new young generation, very well educated, they're secular, they want democracy, they want to be citizens. How is that and how will that affect the young people and all the people in Israel and, and uh, Palestine and their views and behavior? Everybody hear that? No. The, the, the characteristics of, of uh, the Arab Spring in terms of nonviolence, youth, secularism, well-educated, uh, desire for citizenship and dignity, what impact will this have on people in Israel and Palestine? And there was someone back here, yes. This is a question for Dr. D. You had characterized the Islamist paradigm as anti-Israel and the new paradigm as, pro as not anti-Israel. I wonder if you would accept the qualification of that. There are numerous examples, but I'm thinking of the Egyptian cooperation under pressure, no doubt, from the U.S. in the siege of Gaza. And I understand that we learned yesterday that the new foreign minister of Egypt had said that he thought the siege of Gaza was a war crime and possibly a crime against humanity, and that he did not want to see Egypt continue to cooperate in that. So in, in a, there are many ways in which the, the old paradigm cooperated with some very uh, unpalatable aspects of Israeli foreign policy, and the new paradigm while not being anti-Israel in the sense of wanting to obliterate it, may not want to continue to cooperate with the oppression of their fellow Palestinians as they want peace and civil rights for themselves. We can assume that they will be sympathetic to the drive for peace and civil rights for others. So in the short term, Israel may find uh, that the new paradigm is less um, able to be cooperative into the unpalatable aspects of their foreign policy. And they may see that as, as not being favorable. I think that's a very good sign. So the impact of the old and, and new paradigm on, on of, of, and what impact that has on, on relations with Israel uh, from Arab countries. So let's, which of you would like to start? Yes, I think that is a question I have as well. I mean, obviously, we give uh, a lot of money to Israel, and it's not just that aid; it's military cooperation, intelligence cooperation across the board. And there's there's a lot of ways to kind of signal displeasure. I mean, there's also um, 
as, as the first President Bush did, which was to uh, you know withhold certain loan guarantees based on because of continued settlement growth. But the, the obviously it's very politically costly. That's a reality of American politics. And um, I think this president, by by choosing what he's doing, what he's done, which is to continue the aid and to in fact deepen um, the security cooperation. I've heard repeatedly from from Israeli officials. Um, that the cooperation specifically on the Iran question is deeper than it's ever been. It is deeper than even under George W. Bush. That's something President Obama committed to very shortly after coming into office, was to take a, a new a policy review of the Iran nuclear question and to deepen the cooperation and coordination with, with the Israelis on that question as a way of reassuring them. Um, now, given the behavior of Netanyahu toward President Obama, that I, I, as far as Netanyahu is concerned, he's just kind of pocketed and moved on. But I think that understanding exists in the Israeli defense establishment. There's no question for them that President Obama uh, has been very good on this question. So it gets it comes back to reassuring them on their security and then trying to engage them in, in, a, in a peace process. So, but if but if we're talking about Congress, um, again, it comes down to how much political capital, how much energy the pre president is able to really risk on this, given all the other items he has on his agenda. So I guess my answer to, to, to you would be, you know, don't expect there to be a real effort on kind of limiting the aid or tying the aid or pegging it to certain Israeli policy changes. I think the president is really trying to keep this in his own yard and his ability to deal with it through the executive versus having to engage Congress on it. In fact, uh, it has already had an impact on the Palestinians. Um, you may have seen um, what some of the young people in Gaza have done. Uh, they have changed. They really are tired of the Hamas uh, uh, <coughs> mantra of fighting, not recognizing, and so on. They want to be uh, part of a solution. Not, not part of the problem. So it is playing out. Uh, there, is, there is no doubt about it. Uh, Palestinians, uh, both uh, in Gaza and West Bank, are uh, responding to what is happening in the region. And it's a very positive sign. Uh, because if young people are changing, and we think young people are the future, and their, their uh, attitude is no more violence, no more radicalism, then it bodes well for the peace process in the long run. Uh, with respect to the foreign minister and, and his statement, um, as you rightly pointed out, those paradigms overlap. And I was trying just for the elegance of it to separate each one and to create a continuum from the socialist to the Islamist to the, uh, to the new uh, democratic uh, paradigm, but they do overlap. In other words, there's still the socialist Arab nationalists. There are still uh, certainly the Islamists uh, that are playing a role. But the third paradigm is the new paradigm. It's one that's breaking, breaking the, the way that people have been thinking for the past 30 years. On the, in terms of the Islamists. So uh, the statements that are being made by the foreign minister or the statements that are made by <coughs> others uh, or the type of um, conflict that we've seen uh, with the cops in Egypt, they do belong to the previous paradigm. Now, whether um, the... Um, Egyptians, the young Egyptians, sympathize with Palestinians. Of course they do. I mean, there is, there is no doubt whether uh, they're going to be critical of some of the policies uh, of the previous regime. Uh, of course they would be. Uh, now, what does that mean? They can be critical, but will that mean that they will support violence, that they will support? No. And so, yes, of course there will be criticism. Yes, there will be support. But the concept, this is why I was saying nationalism, perhaps I couldn't explain it well. 
Each in each country, young people want to solve their problems themselves. And they see the Arab Israeli conflict a bit this way. They think, okay, so Palestinians have to sit with the with the Israelis and solve the problem and talk it out and do it non violently. In other words, it is the same thing as New Zealand sitting down and resolving their problem and the Egyptians doing the same. So support is yes, sympathy for the demands of the Palestinians, but not creating a crisis in the region that would uh, that would affect the relations between Egypt and, and Israel. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, so let's get some folks in the back and uh, here and then there and then there. Please. Okay. Uh, we've, we've been talking a lot about uh, politics on the political level. I want to um, shift the discussion to civil society, and in particular to two things that have happened over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the most recent is the Kairos Palestine document, which is uh, uh, a um, plea from Palestinian churches ecumenically to the churches of the world to participate with them in basically a nonviolent resistance to the occupation. At the end of that document references the BDS, or the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, which is the civil society call from Palestinians globally to participate in Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions to exert pressure uh, on Israel. Um, so there's a sense that civil society has an important role to play in the politics, in driving or in pushing the political process, which has seems to have faltered. Uh, and in particular, this applies uh, to the churches uh, that have been dealing with BDS uh, in terms of their own internal uh, policies and, and governance as they struggle with the issue of uh, divesting their own pension funds and also educating their own people about the uh, about that global movement. So I'd like you to comment on that, please, both speakers. Okay. So the question of the civil society's uh, role and impact uh, and related questions of the Cairo's Palestinian doctrine doc, 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 why is there so little mention of violations of the Geneva Convention and the United UN resolutions? Is there a free pass operating somewhere? Thank you. Well, why don't we hear more about international law? Why, why not? Why not that context and uh, the violations of law? I think there was one here, I forget, were you the person that had your hand up? And then we, we'll have time for another round. Uh, I'm wondering what are the ways that the United States on the government and on a civil level can show support for positive change in the Middle East without being seen as overstepping their boundaries? Much of this revolution, if not all of it, was propagated and put out locally and regionally without foreign intervention sans possible question of Libya, perhaps intervening there, but I'm wondering how can we as the U.S. on a government level and other levels show support more for that personal level as opposed to via military and security forces as a solid action? Okay, so alternative ways or the ways that the U.S. can be supportive of the democratization movement so without being engaged militarily. Who would like to start on that? Uh, just in terms of um, the, the Cairo document and the, the nonviolent resistance, I think, as many of you probably know, there has, over the past several years, developed a pretty vibrant, nonviolent, unarmed struggle uh, in the West Bank. Many, I think you may be watching the Blue Rose during this conference, which, which looks at the college in, in the West Bank, and successfully uh, the building of the, the security wall. Um, so yeah, I think this this awareness, this, you know, this, the pro violence movement is, is rising and rising, and people are, are more and more aware of it. And I think it's it's very very important to, to make Americans aware, given the, 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 the how often I seem to see Americans asking where's the Palestinian Gandhi? Well, well, here they are. Um, on the question of BDS and boycott, I, I, I struggle with this um, because obviously I think the, the use of boycotts to express political preferences is all fine. Um, 
but I think we have to recognize the role that, that historically the use of boycott plays in Jewish consciousness and in Jewish history, the role of boycotts used in Germany in the 1930s. That's still very present in, in the, the minds of, of many Israeli Jews and in Jewish communities elsewhere. So if our goal is to kind of make certain preferences clear to Israelis about their policies of their country, I think using boycotts um, in, in that way has a risk of, of really alienating them. And that's kind of a side that just defeats the purpose, I think. Um, on a personal level, I, um, of how or, or what the U.S. can do to uh, to support, I think I would just note here, you know, look at Egypt uh, again. As I said in, in my remarks earlier, I think the U.S. definitely needs to do exactly what you asked, which is expand engagement beyond the military. But it was the extensive and deep U.S. military relationship with the Egyptian military that I think gave us some important leverage and influence in what happened in Egypt. And I think it's a matter of using that influence in a much more productive and positive way, but of course also expanding beyond that, whether it's you know scholarly exchanges, um, church groups like this, creating relationships with churches and mosques and, 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 and other religious communities elsewhere, and it's, you know bringing people over here and going over there. Um, but again, I think the military relationship I don't need to diminish it. I think it's an important one to have. It's just important that that not be the only kind of conflict. International law, you want to say something? Um, well, I mean, international law is a function of the international community's ability to enforce international law. Um, and I think while there are there's a certain legal consensus that exists in regard to certain behavior, um, the ability to enforce that consensus um, is still very much a reflection of the international community coming together and saying, yes, this is a priority. And, and, you know, when you look at Israeli abuses, which I think they exist, and I think it's right that they be condemned, I mean, compared to, there are abuses in other countries, too. And I'm, not, I'm certainly not trying to make excuses for them. But I, I would say that I think the Israeli government has a point when they ask, well, why us and not other countries? So, again, I, I feel kind of funny offering that in response. That's not to, again, it's not to, to diminish, I'm just saying that the enforcement of international law really requires getting international parties and inter international bodies to move on, on enforcing it, and that's, I think, as we've seen, difficult. This is the last round. One, two, I think you cut it before, so let's get somebody quite short sleeve shirt. Okay, go ahead. I'd like to just try to connect three dots. One is the A question, and what, where is American money going? The second is the question of international law, and are we um, giving a free pass to an occupation that's clearly against international law? And the third is that we're here to lobby Congress, and Congress's job is financial oversight. And so what I'd like you to elaborate on is what would be a call for financial oversight for this Congress to find out if American dollars are going to fund the occupation exactly in what ways, what ramifications could you see of that rattling around in this area? Okay, who is next? I've kind of lost. Okay. Who's next? Okay. Uh, I want to raise a question that I that touched on, but, but uh, it really relates to the question of youth. Uh, this is perception in Israel, uh, not just among the youth, but in the population or the majority. Of there's been a, a trend to the right, uh, influenced by the settler movement, et cetera. But I've seen statistics that suggest that the Israeli youth, to, to a disproportionate extent, share the opinion is really they're strong enough and dominant enough, they don't really need to make concessions. Uh, and I, I suspect that some of Netanyahu's approach has been quite influenced by, it, by his opinion behind it. On the Palestinian side, there were folks, uh, I spoke to Diana Butu in uh, Israel a couple of years ago, and it was clear that she'd been off Obama completely. And there's a strong sentiment of cynicism about the two-state solution, uh, particularly among Palestinian activist youth. Uh, the business about the Kairos document reflects this, I think. Uh, I'm wondering, and these folks have a disproportionate influence uh, in among people sympathetic to the Palestinians, to my perception. Um, it, it goes to talk about a two to 
solid state solution as well as BDS, it is, it seems to me that these two groups on each side complement each other. Now I'm wondering how much of a factor they might be in obstructing progress towards the two state solution. Back here. I just wondered what the effect would be on refugees living outside of Palestine if Palestine is successful in declaring unilaterally a state and having it approved by the United Nations. And I think uh, behind in the yellow shirt, do you have a question? Let's get one more, and then that's, I'm afraid that's it. Um, this is less a question than a perception, and it speaks to the whole issue of perception. There are millions of people on the ground, both in the United States and in the Middle East, who do not have the benefit of this excellent analysis and intellectual processes. Um, what they're working from is their gut of their experience and what happens. And it seems to me, even in your, con in your comment about BDS, that um, when that happened to, uh, in the Holocaust, it was to a people versus to a state. And I think that we often have this problem that when we find ourselves in any which way supporting a people, it is often um, what uh, Archbishop Shakur said, denying the other. And how do we deal with perception that whenever you make a statement about Israel that it's considered a um, statement against the Jewish people, or when there's any kind of support for the Palestinian cause of which there is rightful reason to support, it's seen as a statement against the Jewish people. How do we deal with that perception? Thank you. Okay. It's both among uh, the Israeli Jews and the Palestinians about uh, the statements that are made, what they actually mean to their own lives. In other words, they hear uh, statements being made on television, by radio, and now on Facebook and other places. But uh, they are also realists. They live in the area. They understand what is happening. They understand to what degree statements can be made and are not necessarily, uh, are not necessarily meant to offend any one group or the other. So I would not underestimate the, the fundamental pragmatism of people in the region. And, uh, you know, today they'll hear a speech, tomorrow they'll hear another, the, the day after they'll hear it, so, you know, there will be a bit of discussion. But fundamentally, they do understand the, the, the problems they're facing. And, uh, you know, and on the other hand, you know, there will always be a uh, groups that will condemn whatever is being said and, and done and, and feel uh, uh, and feel affected. Um, but but basically, what I want to say is that people are pragmatic. Young people are pragmatic, and even though they may not have you know uh, an intellectual framework to discuss uh, their ideas, uh, they understand um, how politics works and how it affects them. Uh, the question of the effect on refugees if Palestine is approved, I mean, it's not going to be approved. Uh, we know that, uh, uh, I mean, the two-state solution in, in terms of uh, the, um, the Palestinian bringing up to the, to the United Nations their proposal for a two-state solution. At this point, the U.S. clearly has said it will not uh, approve a unilateral decision to be made. So I don't think that this is, at this point, a, an issue. Eventually, when there are two states, when everybody comes to an agreement and there are two states uh, that, are, that are formed, uh, this agreement will include the two basic issues, uh, the status of Jerusalem and the return of the refugees. So, in other words, the final solution on the two states will have to include these two uh, pending issues. Uh, but what is going to happen in September probably will be, uh, will not
not include the app. Will not be. Uh, will not be uh, there. And um, with respect to youth perception, uh, again, uh, you know what you said is absolutely true um, about uh, about youth. Um, thinking they're strong enough, you know, not to need to make concessions and the others, uh, uh, mirror imaging on the other side. But this has always been the case. There's always been those who feel that they don't need to make concessions. But at the end of the day, everyone is going to have to make concessions. There's going to be peace and stability in the region. They're going to have to be uh, making concessions. And again, it's like, it's, it's the statement that was made earlier about perception. Um, people are pragmatic, and if they want stability and peace in the region, which I firmly believe they do, and I firmly believe the young people want, and um, then they will have to make concessions. Um, with respect to USAID, I think my colleague here has more to say than I do. On the question of how to deal with the perception, I think we used, you said about the, the sort of zero sum perception of what you in support of the Palestinians, you must be anti Israel and vice versa. I think the reality of this issue and it's, it's how fraught it is with emotions and, and sensitivities, I think it just it just requires a kind of a bit of rhetorical throat clearing anytime you address it. I mean that's I, again I just come to accept that. It's it's one that's so bound up with so much sensitivity and an emotional response that if one's to address this effectively and productively, one has to kind of make assurances all around to show where you, where you come from. I mean, that, but that's if you, you know, if you're interested in changing people's minds. I mean, there's a time for expressing anger, um, but if your goal is to change people's minds, I think checking those boxes and making those assurances before getting to the real issue, it's sometimes exhausting, but that is the reality of this issue. Um, as for the attitudes of the youth, I think it's a very good point. I, I would differentiate between the Israeli and the Palestinian side. So when I was there last October, um, and I met with a number of students at the IDC, the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, which is this very technologically advanced, beautiful campus in Herzliya, north of Tel Aviv, and met with a number of students in the computer lab working on very interesting, interesting things. And the sense I got from them, well, I think that the trends that you described toward the right is real. Um, among these youth, it was more of just a sense of exhaustion and you know, wanting to carry on a normal life without having to be identified constantly with this conflict. Um, it, it was, but again, you know, apathy, and I wouldn't, maybe this wasn't apathy, it was just exhaustion at having to constantly reference their own lives as far as the world is concerned to this conflict. But you know, apathy does, it, it, it's a vote for the status quo. So I think effectively, if you don't want to get involved in politics, that's a political choice as well. Uh, for Palestinians, they don't have that luxury. Obviously, Palestinians living in the in the West Bank and in Gaza, their lives are defined by the occupation. To go from their village to another village to visit their relatives, that's defined by the occupation every single day. So again, I've noticed exactly what you said as well. There is an increasing sense among, especially younger Palestinians, that this it's not worked. It's over. Um, we've. We see, we've seen our leaders sign all these pieces of paper and we've gotten increased occupation. It's gotten worse and this comes back to what I said earlier about dignity. I think the desire and the expectation and the feeling, the right feeling, I think, the entitlement, they're entitled to live a life of dignity that they are being denied is very, very powerful. And I think, um, you know, in this, uh, Dr. Deeb talked about um, the, the beginning of the Arab Spring in, in Lebanon in 2005. I, I, would, I would go back even further and say the echoes of this are in the first Intifada, which was an expression of Palestinians' anger at being denied a life of, of basic dignity. Um, so again, I would think as you go and you, you, you talk to Congress tomorrow, those ba that basic point that what's happening in Palestine must not be decoupled with what is happening in the rest of the Arab world, these sentiments are, are very much similar. So, thank you. Well, let's give our uh, panelists a